I think TED audiences are some of the best in the world because they're so interested in everything and they're curious about different viewpoints, so it's just a pleasure to be here. Transformation. What causes it? When you think about transformation, where it takes us, where it starts, we can't help but think about imagination. With imagination, I go back to an essay written by Father Pedro Rupe a number of years ago where he wrote about love and imagination. And in that, he said, what captures our imagination, what we fall in love with, it will decide everything. It will determine what gets us out of bed in the morning, how we spend our weekends, what we read, who we know, what breaks our heart, and what fills us with joy and gratitude. In this particular project, imagination about how could higher education influence the world captured many of us. As Steve and Sonal just mentioned, there has been so much work that's happened around the area of human development. It's so exciting, it's inspiring. And yet we all continue on this journey because we know if I'm the one in poverty or if you are or if your children are, even one person is too many. So we began to look at how could higher education make a difference in this world. We know from the Human Development Index data that the parts of the world where there is the lowest education it leads to and contributes to high poverty and high conflict. A small group of people began to imagine a process where higher education could be available to all those at the margins of the world, wherever they are. We listened in that conversation to a Jesuit from Australia, Michael Smith. Michael posed a question after being on the Thai-Burma border where he was working with Burmese refugees and he saw people who were standing around and he came to the group and he said, the people I met, they are so smart, they are so bright and they are standing, literally standing and watching their lives go by. When I heard that, I could physically, viscerally feel what that must be like to be trapped. If you're smart enough and you're filled with energy but you have nowhere to go, nowhere to connect with the world. For me, I thought that would be like waking up in hell. There must be something that we can do. At that time, I was the dean of the School of Professional Studies. It was a large school that focused on health and leadership. And on behalf of the university where I was, we were implementing online learning. So we were learning a lot about access to higher education. So. I had been the dean about 11 years and asked if I could have a leave for two months so that I could go along with my husband, Tom, who is a professor of education at Lewis Clark State College, to go to the Thai Burma border and try to answer Michael Smith's call of isn't there something that we could do. So we went to the Thai Burma border where we spent about two months to help Australia Catholic University implement an online diploma program. While we were there, it was amazing. We met these incredible students. And through the process of the program, we could see already they were beginning to transform their thinking and get new ideas. But what struck us even more was how incredible it was that through access to higher education, and in this case, online learning, that the voice of these students could also now be heard in the world. So they were now able to influence the thinking of others as well as the education program influencing them. There were many other people who answered the call to action of isn't there something we can do with equally important roles. From the collective wisdom that occurred after the Thai Burma experience and the experience of many others who started to answer Michael's call, we came up with an idea 
that's led now to what's called Jesuit Commons Higher Education at the Margins, and that is that there must be a way to have a sustainable, scalable, transferable curriculum available for people who live, for people who live at the margins. When we think about sustainable, scalable, and transferable, we reached back into the 450-year history of Jesuit education to create a curriculum that would be transformational, at least it would have the track record of being transformational. Two academic programs came out of that discussion. One is a diploma in liberal studies. That program is offered online. The second curricular offering of Jesuit Commons Higher Education at the Margins is certificate level programs that are on topics identified by refugees and others at the margins who um, believe that education could solve that particular problem. So we have many different categories of community service learning tracks. When we think about the power of higher education and how it can transform thinking and lives, it made us think further and more deeply about the margins. Who lives there? What do they need? How do they let us know what they need? My family is a big resource in this work, and I often go to my husband and my, my kids for advice. And on one particularly challenging uh, time, I called my sister Diane to get her advice because she always asks the best questions. And on this particular one that I was asking her about, she said, well, before I answer, first tell me, what is it? What, what do you mean at the margins? Well, it took me back to when, with the group of people, we started to envision J.C. Hem, higher ed at the margins. And people would sometimes envision it as at the margins being the economic margins. Other times, people would see it as the geographic margins. Both are true. When I asked our students, what does it mean to you, higher education at the margins? One quiet, bright woman stood and holding up a piece of yellow paper that she had just received to take some notes on in the class, she pointed to the red margin and she said, to me, at the margins means this is where we begin. I thought that was really profound because that's what we were doing. So at the margins, we began with J.C. Hem. We developed, articulated our vision for what it meant to bring higher education to the margins. And basically, it comes down to higher education, transform thinking, transform the world. We already knew a lot about how to bring higher education through technology. We knew how to support students <coughs> online, how to support faculty, how to develop programs on site. We already knew that through low bandwidth, we could still open the doors to higher education. It was going to be, um, th those things were, were doable. What was amazing to us is the individual collective goodwill that happened among people who participated with us. We learned a great deal about innovation, and as Sonal said and Steve in their talks, the big thing is to begin. We learned that through innovation, people do need to imagine a different future. There is a different way to do things, and it takes leaders and leadership it takes people willing to trust that they can roll up their sleeves, go forward without all of the answers, and begin. So that's really how J.C. Hem started. The collective goodwill of many people that included the voices of those at, those at the margins. We met many partners along the way, organizations and individuals. We felt the, uh, the vision of Jesuit Commons higher at the margins was very compelling. For me, at that time, I left the dean's position to answer the invitation to be the international director of this work. 
for Jesuit Jeju Refugee Service through Father Peter Belias, the International Director. He came and he said, JRS will be your on-site partner. There are millions of refugees and internally displaced people around the world. Of that population, less than 1% has access to higher education. Of those refugees who live in camps, their average length of stay is 18 years. There are generations of people who have not had access to higher education. It's one of the reasons that the United Nations High Commission on Refugees has in, now identified in their strategic document of 2014 and beyond that higher education is a basic human right. So through JRS, we had a, an incredible partner. Regis University said, we'll join you and be the awarding university for the diploma in liberal studies offered online. Jesuit Net said, we will come and help you with technology and with curriculum. Gonzaga University said, we'll offer staff support and an office space. And Georgetown University is now prepared to be our host university for a robust learning management system and a student information system, and that is going to change our day because we are now gonna have a way to track data for a long time to see if, in fact, in addition to the day-to-day -day data that we keep, if in 50 years from now has higher education shifted that human development index, if we change that domino and high education is available, can it decrease poverty and decrease conflict? So with our partners, we recognize the margins are vast. There are many places we could go. People said come to inner cities in the United States. Go wherever there is high poverty, low education, and there's conflict. We couldn't start everywhere, so we started in three places. Kakuma Camp in northern Kenya, just south of the South Sudanese border. 09, 87,000 people live there. Today, 127,000 plus live there. When we first went as an assessment team, we met over 200 people who were interested in higher education. Kakuma is one of those places that you could consider is out of sight, out of mind. Of the people that came, one man stood at the end of the presentation, and he said, you know, we've always felt that the world has forgotten us. If this program comes, we'll know that isn't true. We also went to Zalika Camp in Malawi. It's near the city of Lalongwe, which is the capital. We went to Syria, to Aleppo, and we learned so much at each place. In Kakuma, we learned about how do you bring higher education with reliable internet, low bandwidth, to a dusty, hot environment. In Malawi, how do you power the lab with solar when solar wasn't really that present in the country? In Syria, we learned, began to learn how to help education reach the disenfranchised in the inner city poor. In Syria, the war was just beginning to escalate. And if you ever wonder what does higher education mean to those at the margins, this picture says it all. It was December 2011. Electricity had been shut off most of the days. Fuel had been cut off. We were offering three community service tracks in Aleppo. Our students, we didn't know if they'd come. The on-site track facilitator was going to go just in case. He showed up, and what you see in the picture is that every student in the track braved the unsafe streets. They brought candles out because of no electricity. They studied in candlelight. They kept their coats on to stay warm, and the class went on. Shortly after that, our center in Syria was bombed. We've learned a lot about what it takes to keep higher ed in unstable areas. We weren't able to keep going in Syria. But we think about those people every day. And we moved to Amman, Jordan, where a country is anticipating over a million refugees by the end of the year. 
So we have learned a lot, including from our students. Their collective voice is incredible. They inspire each other to think beyond politics, beyond religion, beyond boundaries of ethnicity. They're incredible. Our faculty volunteer to teach online, and they span every time zone of the world. We have incredible partners in organizations and in individuals to help us think through this in many different ways. Where we are headed is to really get clear on what does transformed thinking look like. It's a student in the world religion class that says, you know, before I took this class, it didn't occur to me that where I was born affected what my religion is. So maybe we don't have to hate each other because people are born in different parts of the world. We think about the student's collective voice now reaching the world. Through access to education, we are no longer denied their voice, and collectively, they roar. They have incredible insights, incredible things to say. What does a transformed world look like? A transformed world looks like those students executing why they said they wanted to access higher ed, and that is to make a difference to their world, to their community, to their families, and to their neighborhoods. During one particular course, a student was talking about a turning point, an event that we all experience where our life changes afterwards, more so than who we were before the event. There were many incredible stories, and as we listened to one especially profound story of a, of a student, it took us to just silence. And after a few moments, a student from a different country, a different religion, stood and he looked at the other student and he said, my friend, we have heard your story and now we are part of it. You are not alone. So with J.C. Hem, we are grateful to you for listening to the story. You have heard it. You're now part of it. So we are, no, we are not in this work alone. What captures our imagination will truly change everything. Thank you.